What better way to kick off the second half of this season of upsets than for the NFL's two remaining winless teams to taste victory for the first time? New coach Homer Rice described his 0-8 Cincinnati Bengals as a team ready to explode. And last week, the Houston Oilers became the victims of Rice's unerring prophecy. Dan Pastorini's league-leading protective pocket was pierced by the Bengals' roaring defense, which held Houston scoreless until the final quarter. The big change in the Bengals was their offense, which had ranked last in the conference in both point production and yardage gained. The prime reason for the turnaround was their quarterback, Kenny Anderson, obviously healthy again, for he threw bombs of 43 and 57 yards to set up two short scoring runs. The Bengals' sad ground game received a shot of lightning from rookie David Turner, number 22, who broke off a 65-yard run, which led to a third Bengal touchdown. Houston, still harboring hopes of catching first place Pittsburgh in the AFC Central Division, scored twice on Pastorini passes in the fourth quarter. But Ken Anderson provided the clincher with another bomb. This one 45 yards to his old passing partner, Isaac Curtis, whose score put the game out of reach of the Oilers. The 28-13 victory halted Cincinnati's fast fall at eight games and gave Homer Rice his first win as a pro. In Philadelphia, Jim Hart was an 11th hour surprise as Cardinal quarterback as the league's other big loser, St. Louis, upset the Eagles 16-10. Scrappy Eagles stayed close despite injuries that decimated their supply of running backs. Number 66 All-Pro middle linebacker Bill Berge sparked a defense that picked off three Cardinal passes. The interceptions kept the Eagles competitive in the face of Hart's whopping 223 yards passing in the first half alone. With no healthy backs, Philadelphia went airborne and got their only touchdown of the sunny afternoon when Ron Jaworski, the NFC's leading passer statistically, arched a perfect pass to towering Harold Carmichael. The six points gave the Eagles a brief 10-6 lead. Four and a half minutes later, the Cardinals came right back, getting a quick score when hard hit rookie receiver Dave Steef for a 55-yard touchdown down the right sideline. It was the rookie's first pro reception, and it meant the ball game. For 62-year-old Bud Wilkinson, who had put his legendary reputation on the line with his return to coaching, it was a first victory in 15 years and a first smile in nine weeks. The former Oklahoma coach had borne the burden of the Cardinals' losing streak with calm dignity. And now with nine weeks of searing frustration finally over, Wilkinson walked the sideline a winner for the first time in his professional career. For one week at least, the National Football League was a pleasant place to be for Bud Wilkinson. They're the world champions of professional football. But against the Minnesota Vikings, the Dallas Cowboys look more like a team floundering in futility. Even Dallas's normally sound doomsday defense opened at the Vikings' command.
Number 34, Ricky Young, scored the second of three Viking touchdowns. The final one came on this 12-yard pass from Fran Tarkenton to wide receiver Sammy White. Several weeks ago, NFC title talk had all but eliminated the Vikings. Now, after back-to-back -back wins against Green Bay and Dallas, those purple people have seriously clouded the NFC title picture once more. Not nearly so much confusion in the AFC, where the Pittsburgh Steelers are treating all their opponents to a dose of defense. Here, the Kansas City Chiefs try to reverse. Their one mistake, expecting quarterback Mike Livingston to block all-pro Jack Ham. Thus, the reverse became a flea flicker. Kansas City's improvising was good for 21 points, but late in period three, some faulty ball handling led to the Chiefs' undoing. Number 31, Donnie Shell carried it in. It was the one big play Pittsburgh needed to ice away the persistent Chiefs. Of course, it was also a pretty important moment for Donnie Shell. Shell's touchdown was the clincher in Pittsburgh's 27-24 win. Out in Chicago, a similar situation occurred. There, number 16, Gary Danielson, passed the Detroit Lions into an afternoon-long lead over the troubled Chicago Bears. The Lions forced Chicago to gamble on a fourth-period, fourth-down-and-inches play. This was the game's crucial moment. First down would have sustained Chicago's potential game-winning drive. And if Bear head coach Neil Armstrong had to make the same decision all over again, he probably would. Now, if only that football had been a silly millimeter longer. The measurement sent Detroit into delirium, and it sent Bear fans home to ponder their team's sixth straight defeat. But four losses in five weeks were quite enough for the Cleveland Browns who set out to dazzle the Buffalo Bills. Veteran Calvin Hill's flypaper grab was one of six Cleveland touchdowns, three of which came on Brian's sight passes. This 44-yarder to Reggie Rucker was the longest, and it helped the Browns keep alive their hopes of catching the Steelers in the AFC Central. In the NFC Central, the big matchup found the Tampa Bay Buccaneers in Lambeau Field, Green Bay. Not so long ago, a game with Tampa Bay was the NFL's easiest weekend. But rookie quarterback Doug Williams has changed all that with an arm defenses have to respect. The Packers respected it. They deployed three defenders here to cover Buck receiver Morris Owens. But Owens outgrappled them all. The Packers, however, usually kill off enemy air games at the source. Number 78, Ezra Johnson, is the leader of Green Bay's league-leading pass-rushing unit. While Johnson and friends controlled the buck attack, Green Bay nickeled and dimed their way to this two-yard touchdown by terrible Turdell Middleton. However, Packer place kicker Chester Markle missed the conversion. And when Tampa Bay later scored and made their point after, the pack trailed by one. Thus, with just 41 ticks left on the clock, Markle got his chance at redemption. It's been this kind of season for the Packers, and these spirited youngsters in green and gold have now won seven times. Good for a two-game lead in the NFC Central. Some folks keep predicting Bart Starr's young team will soon fold, just as they keep saying Dallas will soon catch fire. But in the spirit of this crazy 1978 season, perhaps neither event will happen.
New England fans have grown fat-headed for good reason. Their Patriots are a dominant team, tough on defense, often fast and flashy on offense. The only drawback has been the inconsistent generalship of Steve Grogan, who often is forced to outrun his throwing mistakes. But against the New York Jets, Grogan stood tall in the pocket and passed for 281 yards and four touchdowns in the first half alone. Besides muscling passes past the Jets, he displayed touch and timing on screen passes that opened up the field for Sam Cunningham, number 39. Not since the heyday of Mac Heron have the Patriots possessed the game-breaking running back, but in number 23, Horace Ivory, they may have found a candidate. Ivory scored twice, and all in all, the Patriots were simply devastating as they routed the Jets 55 to 21. In another AFC Eastern Division game, Baltimore flew into Miami on a wing and a prayer, hoping to salvage some respectability, and promptly crash-landed. Errors and lackadaisical play have broken the Colts all season long and have overshadowed their finer efforts. The only moment of Baltimore brilliance was this superb Glenn Dowdy touchdown catch from third stringer Mike Kirkland. Dolphins scoring chances were not as fleeting. Bob Greasy has returned to form and has shown no lingering effects from his knee injury. This perfectly thrown pass to Duriel Harris, number 82, was one of two touchdown tosses on the day for the veteran Dolphin. A healthy Bob Greasy as well as a dynamic Delvin Williams have bolstered the Dolphin attack of late. Looking like his lightning predecessor, Mercury Morris, Williams number 24 used his speed and agility to gain 98 yards against the Colts, adding to his league lead in rushing. Baltimore's answer to Delvin Williams is Joe Washington number 20, but little Joe never even had an opportunity to smell the Dolphin end zone. Miami, on the other hand, penetrated the Baltimore goal line when necessary and occasionally even resorted to trickery in doing so. This downstrike to Vern Denherter mischief gave the Dolphins a 26-8 victory and kept them a game off the pace behind the surging Patriots. A subdued optimism settled upon San Diego as the Chargers sought to revenge a heartbreaking loss to the Oakland Raiders earlier in the season. One individual who made revenge seem unattainable was rookie Art Whittington, number 22, whose ability to get outside complements Mark Van Egan's power running up the gut. Another Charger nemesis was wise Oakland quarterback Kenny Stabler. Observing that San Diego was worried about the Oakland ground game, Stabler went to the air with emphatic results from sure-handed tight end Dave Casper, who would not be denied seven. Down 20 to 7 at the half, the Chargers shut down the Raider ground game and set their sights on the head of the problem. Relentlessly, the defensive front stalked Stabler with number 68 Leroy Jones leading the way, proving why San Diego is first in the AFC in sacks. Inspired by the defensive sacking clinic, Dan Fouts and the Charger offense came to life. With 52 seconds remaining, this 29-yard touchdown pass from Fouts to Greg McCrary, number 88, climaxed a masterful come-from-behind Charger triumph in Oakland. While the Chargers savored sweet revenge, Oakland defensive end Ted Hendricks wondered just how long it's been since the Raiders lost two in a row.
While Washington has been criticized for their policy of finding a place for old, over-the-hill players within their organization, last Sunday the Redskins showed there was some sense to this practice. With his offense one step away from the morgue, Jack Pardee called upon that crafty old codger, Dr. Kilmer. And sure enough, old Billy had a prescription that soon had the Redskins leaping from their deathbed and right on past the San Francisco 49ers. Two touchdown passes by the 39-year-old Kilmer proved to be just what the doctor ordered as Washington silenced the belief that rigor mortis had set in by scoring a 38 to 20 victory. Seattle Seahawks have never lacked confidence. However, last week in the Kingdome, it was difficult to determine whether Seattle gathered their assurance from their own abilities or Denver's disorder. With their offense reduced to kickers as primary targets, Denver seemed no match for the high-flying Seahawks. With an opportunity to upset the defending AFC champions, Seattle pulled out all the stops. And as usual, it was that zany Zoomer Jim Zorn who did the pulling. Seattle sped away to an early lead, yet the contest never got out of hand because Denver has consistently shown that all you need is a break here and there in order to win. The Broncos used several missed tackles to keep the game tied at 17, then hung on through almost 13 minutes of overtime until they got the big break for which their defense is famous. Steve Foley's interception led to a field goal and a 20 to 17 win and prove that you don't always have to be lucky to win, but it sure helps. In the Superdome, the Saints' only knowledge of luck has been bad, and with the New York Giants in town from the opening punt, it seemed assured that their fortunes weren't about to change. Giants build a comfortable 17-7 bulge by halftime, then seem content to just run a host of backs like number 44 Doug Kodar off tackle until time ran out. Their strategy seemed sound because the Giants defense had managed with a series of blitzes to keep the Saints passing game bottled up. This problem would most certainly have gone unsolved with Saints teams of the past, but today's club has made a habit of problem solving. To offset the blitz, Archie Manning turned to a series of play action passes that repeatedly permitted him the luxury of time and choice. This strategy proved effective throughout the afternoon and especially near the goal line. For there, a linebacker is forced to acknowledge any play fake, and one step forward is all a tight end like Henry Childs needs to break free in the end zone. New Orleans used the play action pass as a key to unlock the Giants' end zone. Then with New York on their heels and conscious of the pass off of a play fake, the Saints' Tony Galbraith bolted past the startled New Yorkers for the go-ahead touchdown. The final found the Saints on top, 28 to 17, for their fifth win, and a victory that equals their best year ever.